everybody. It is so wonderful to be in the liberated zone of Christiana after the colonized zone of the Bella Center today. Now, I don't think that Lisa Fithian received an introduction. She introduced us, but for those of you who don't know, Lisa Fithian is really one of the most forceful, powerful activists in the belly of the beast in the United States. And you probably saw her in films about the Seattle shutdown, the World Bank IMF protests, um, the protests against the Democratic National Convention in 2000, uh, when Al Gore was there. And it reminds us that back in 2000, we understood as a movement that the Democratic Party of the United States was no ally of ours. They were the ones tear gassing us and pepper spraying us and attacking us in the streets. We understood that this was part of one system. And unfortunately, a lot of people have forgotten that and convinced themselves that the Democratic Party under Barack Obama is gonna save us. But we did know that back in 2000. So it's good to see you again, Lisa. It's good to be here with so many old and new friends. Um, it's so wonderful to be here with my dear friend, Michael Hart. And I told uh, Tazio the other day when we first met that he's actually the reason I'm here in Copenhagen because he wrote an article uh, making the argument for why this summit, this gathering was important to her taking the movement that we built uh, on the streets, in Seattle, in Genoa, the movements of the South that really taught us how to do this, the Zapatista movement, that this represented the next stage of our movement. And for me, I had sworn off summit hopping. I kicked the habit. I haven't been to a summit in at least five years. <laughs> um, but I, have no, I make no apologies for being in Copenhagen these two weeks. This matters. We're building something powerful. We are taking our movement and our analysis to a whole new stage. I think the air is electric. It is electric. And you know, the environmental movement, certainly in, in the rich countries, has something of a reputation as being a little bit touchy-feely, kind of let's all hold hands and sing kumbaya. We're all in it together. Everybody has... <laughs> I was just getting to the good part. Um, you know, we hear everybody has grandkids. Even Dick Cheney has grandkids. We all want to save the world, right? And it's an analysis that erases class. It erases race. It erases North and South. And it tries to pretend that we are all equally responsible um, and that we are all affected uh, by the climate crisis in the same way. This is a great lie, and it has been exposed here in Copenhagen. Climate change has been revealed as a class war that, has, that is being waged and that has been waged by the rich against the poor. The facts are dead simple. The facts are dead simple. We know what caused the climate crisis. It's greenhouse gas emissions. We know where they were produced. 75 to 80% of them were produced in the rich world by 20% of the world's population. That's you, that's me in Canada, that's the whole EU. We created the emissions that are warming this planet to catastrophic levels. The problem is that out of some cruel geographic irony, the effects of our emissions are overwhelmingly being felt in those countries that did the absolute least to produce this crisis. And here's the catch. We know, we know the truth, we've read the science, and we refuse to change our behavior. So there is a very angry, a righteous anger that is emerging from the global south. And it has a voice here in Copenhagen. It isn't gonna end up in the final document of whatever deal they try to sell, but it is finding a voice, and it's a powerful voice. And what the 16th is really about, I think, is making an alliance from the outside with that voice on the inside, saying that we are with you, we understand that this is a class war, we want no part of it, and we're fighting side by side with you. We need to...
we owe a debt. We in the, in the rich world owe a debt that we will never repay. We'll never be able to repay because unlike the way this is covered in the media, as if it's just poor countries asking for money, it's not about money. You can't repair the loss of life, of nature, of biodiversity, but we, to begin to repair, we need to acknowledge that debt. And what's important about the discourse that's so powerful coming from the Global South right now about climate debt is that we know that, that economic debt is a tool of domination and enforcement. It's how our governments enforce their neoliberal capitalist policies around the world. So for the Global South to come to the table and say, wait a minute, we are the creditors and you are the debtors. You owe us a huge debt, creates an equalizing dynamic in the negotiations. That that's why this matters. It is about power. This whole discourse is about changing the, turning the world upside down. Turning the world upside down or right side up again. Um, and we need to, to do what we can to be a part of that. It's, I feel it's really an exciting moment and it's growing fast. And today I, I, I had the pleasure of having lunch um, with Marlon Santi, who is the head of CONAI, which is the largest indigenous federation um, in Latin America. Uh, and it represents the indigenous of, um, of Ecuador. And, you know, it was very sad talking to Marlon today because something insane is going on inside the Bella Center where somehow solving the problems of climate change means rewarding with special new business ventures, the very companies that are responsible for the climate crisis, giving them new carbon markets, allowing them to, to enclose the final uncolonized spaces. That's what this, uh, this, this program that you've heard about called RED, which is about the forest, is really about. It's about colonizing the last uncolonized spaces and turning them into sinks for corporations so that we in the rich world cannot change our ways of life and can keep polluting and we can say that a forest in the Amazon is absorbing our emissions. This is the last colonial pillage. That is what is on the line. And the great irony is that the people who are, who are once again not only least responsible for the crisis, um, but are also living most in harmony with nature and are not, and have a huge amount to teach us, are not only not being helped by these deals, but these deals are threatening their ways of life. They're being pushed off of their lands, cut off from their resources. It's the world upside down. We have to turn it right side up. We have to be so clear on Wednesday. Thank you.